Cole's lesson will come from Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Reju rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in every prayer, everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Good evening, everyone. Let's see. Where is the note? Okay. Oh, thanks. All right. It's pretty fitting that uh, this lesson today is on anxiety because I'm a pretty anxious person as is. And uh, let me tell you, that thing right there is giving me a lot of anxiety at the moment. So we're going to try to get through it. Hopefully we don't lose the PowerPoint, but it's not that important anyway. It's more for me than it is for you guys. And uh, I hope you get something out of this lesson today, because when I, when I say I preach on things that fit me, I mean it. This is probably the most uh, fitting lesson for me to preach today. So, like I said, I hope you guys get something out of it, and we can uh, learn something. I like to thank Nate from for giving me this scripture reading today, and um, go ahead and get started. Um, like I said, I'm a pretty anxious person, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you guys uh, probably the worst state of anxiety I've been in. This was uh, last uh, two semesters ago, so it's been spring twenty one. Um, I had gone into my material science test thinking, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm well okay. The, the class had felt relatively easy up to that point. So I had other midterms that week that I needed to study for. So I, I just went into it with a relatively lax studying. And um, needless to say, I, I did fail that test. Um, and it was uh, about end of September. And let me tell you, my mom will know, she, uh, she dealt with me being probably the worst amount of anxiety that I had ever had for uh, a good three weeks. And uh, eventually I did pull a B plus out of that class. So it all ended okay. But the, that anxiety overtook me. It, it caused me to go into a, a dark place that I, I shouldn't have been in in the first place. It was a hard, it was a hard few weeks. I eventually, after I took the next test, I felt a little better. And then by the end of the semester, I was fine. But that anxiety caused me to, to go to places I didn't think I could go. I was just, I was just cutting myself off. I was sitting, staring at PowerPoints and screens all day just to try to gain back the knowledge that I felt I had lost. And so I, I want you guys to think back to the last time that you were anxious. Like I said, for me, it's right now. There's not a time that I am not anxious. And uh, I, know, I know a lot of us have that issue. And I know, I know some of us are, don't ever get anxious. But to think that there's someone in here that hasn't been anxious within the last year, I, I, I wouldn't believe it. Um, so we have some common causes of anxiety here. School, work, our property, maintaining our property, make sure the grass is mowed, making sure everything looks nice for the neighbors. Family relationships, future, the future, the future is a big one for me. I didn't know what was going to happen the rest of that semester. I was hoping I could at least pull out a passing grade, and I did. Past mistakes may be something that we think about, and I, that's another thing that was affecting me during that time was I just thought about what if I had just studied better. We can easily allow uncertainties to cause anxiety in us and allow us to get into a place where we don't want to be. And anxiety can cripple when it's left under unattended. There's, like I said, I, I think that anxiety is one of the easiest things for us to fall into and allow us to be taken away from God or just be taken away from our friends and family. So let's look at some examples of anxiety that we can find in the Bible. So first we'll start with uh, Exodus 3, uh, 1 through 14. That's Exodus 3, 1 through 14. You'll have to turn your Bibles. I don't have many of these scripture readings on here. Exodus 3, 1 through 14. Now Moses was tending to the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the Mount of God. 
And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning in fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why does the bush not burn? So when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet for this place where you stand is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know that their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up from that land to a good and large land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression which Egyptians oppress them. Now come, therefore, and I will send you Pharaoh that you may send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I want you to look real closely at this next verse. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So Moses goes up to this burning bush. Here's God talking to him. And God says, this is what I want you to do, Moses. I want you to lead my large nation of people out of this country. And I, th I think uh, for good reason, Moses was pretty anxious here. He, uh, he didn't think that he was capable of doing it. Now, obviously, Moses, thinking on his own, he was going to single-handedly lead the Egyptians out of Egypt. And we know this isn't true. We know he had the help of his brother and most importantly, had the help of God. But for Moses to even be capable of doing this, he, he had to be reassured by God. He had to know that Moses, Moses had to know that he was simply just God's vessel, that God would be doing all of the talking for him almost. And we can equate this, I think, to taking like a leadership anxiety or a leadership role in um, like a project or a le new leadership role at work, getting promoted we get this added responsibility and we, we just think to ourselves that we're not capable. Well, we read verse 14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. We just need to think about the fact that God is going to be with us. We, we know that he is capable of leading us through anything that we ask him for help with. Another example here is uh, Jonah. Jonah 1, 1 through 3 reads, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amadai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee from Tarshish to Tarshish and from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, and he paid the fare and went down to it to go with him to Tarshish to, from the presence of the Lord. So you know, we know the story of Jonah. Many of us do. He was told that he needed to go to the city of Nineveh, which was a, a very evil city in the eyes of God. And Jonah knew this. Jonah knew what the consequences of him, or he thought he knew what the consequences of him going to Nineveh would be. He was thinking in the worst case scenario. He, was, he allowed anxiety to get him to the point where he's thinking, I'm going to go to Nineveh and I'm going to be killed. I'm, going to, I'm never going to make it out because I'm trying to preach the will of the Lord. And we know that because of this anxiety, he decided to try to flee God, which obviously we know didn't end up working out for him. So we'll go ahead and turn to Jonah 1, 4 through 17. That's Jonah 1, 4 through 17. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest at the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. And then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God. And threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. 
So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise on, arise and call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know who, whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, please tell us for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. And the men were exceedingly afraid. And he said to him, why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, what shall we do that you do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea and the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. Therefore, they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you, so that they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. So in this case, Jonah had allowed his anxiety to put him in a worse place than he already was. He decided to try to flee, got on a ship. The sh ship came into very tempestuous seas, and eventually they found out Jonah was trying to flee God, and they threw him off the boat. Obviously, we know Jonah eventually goes to Nineveh and preaches the word, and the people in Nineveh actually do end up changing. The best case scenario ends up happening for Jonah. And we know Jonah ends up being angry about this, but it comes back to him being anxious to start with. He allowed his anxiety to put him in a situation that was much worse than what he could have been in to begin with. I think this can often happen to us. We, we often try to avoid one issue and end up falling into a much worse issue just because we're anxious about one outcome over another. Another example here, we'll read from Matthew 26, 31 through 35. It's Matthew 26, 31 through 35. This is the example of Peter's denial. And then Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I've been raised, I will go to before you to Galilee. Then Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the apostles. Peter's making a promise here that we know he doesn't end up keeping. But it's not because of his actual dis, distaste for Jesus or his mistrust of Jesus or anything that is um, a good word. Any, anything malicious against Jesus. And we know he ends up denying Jesus three times before the rooster crows. And it's because of his anxiety about being associated with Jesus. So go ahead and read Matthew 26, 69 through 75. Now, Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you are also we're with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied and with an oath, I do not man know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you are one of the, them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. I think this is another example of something that we as Christians can face anxiety-wise, and it's acknowledging the fact that we are Christians. Sometimes we get into situations where obviously we we want people to know that we are Christians, but we feel like it's the wrong thing to bring up at the time, or we feel like it's going to cause us to get in, in a situation that we don't want to be in. But we know that 
as Christians, our job is to spread the word. Our job is to be a light to the world. We can't deny that we are Christians. We can't even hide that we are Christians. And that's what Peter's doing here. Peter is hiding his association with Jesus for his own sake. I think that leads well into talk, discussing spiritual anxiety. There's a lot of times that we face this anxiety of not either not knowing enough. We don't know if we should either become a Christian or speak or teach or even talk to others as Christians because we don't feel like we know enough. But Hebrews 12, 5 and verse 12 says we must start with the milk of the word. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. And that's okay. We know we know that we need to know the basis of what it means to be a Christian. We need to know the basis of why we are Christians and nothing more. But as we grow, obviously, we want to expand. We want to learn more. We want to get into the meat of the word, less so than the milk. But that's, that's one thing that can stop us as Christians from spreading the word, spreading the gospel. Sometimes it's, it's trying to save family and friends. Some, maybe sometimes we have people that haven't, been, haven't become faithful. We want them to be baptized. We want them to be saved because we know, we at least think we know what their destination is. And maybe we, maybe we fear for them. We, we have anxiety for them, especially those like, I have a grandfather who's not baptized. And I, I, I have anxiety about that. I, I think about that from time to time. But we, we, we know that as long as we are trying our best, there's nothing more we can do. And obviously we, we hope we're wrong. I hope I'm wrong that someone who I believe has not been following the will of God is going to go to hell. I hope I'm wrong about that. I hope that everyone I love and know can make it to heaven. But we don't know. We see what we read, and we believe that this is truth. We believe that, that we need to be faithful Christians and follow the will of God to be, to be sent to heaven. Another thing we think about is, are we doing things in services decently and in order? 1 Corinthians 14 and 40 reads, and we know that we often, oftentimes we're kind of adverse to change. We don't want things within the church to change, but we don't, why do we not want them to change? Do we not want them to change because of it tradition or do we not want them to change because it goes against the will of the Lord or it's not listed in the will of God? We need to look to the word for guidance for these situations. So let's start to talk about how we can overcome this anxiety that we face, how, how we can be better Christians by avoiding anxiety about things that we shouldn't have anxiety about to begin with. So go ahead and read John 16, 16 through 33. It's John 16, 16 through 33. John 16, through, John 16, 16 through 33 reads, A little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me because I go to the Father. Then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us? A little while and you will not see me, and a little while and you will see me. And because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he says? A little while. We do not know what he is saying. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, are you acquiring among, amongst yourselves about what I said? A little while and you will see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned to joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come, but as soon as she has given birth to the child, she, has no, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice, and your joy will no, no one will take from you. And in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, but the time is coming when, you will no longer, when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but I'll tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask my name, and I do not say to you that I should pray the Father for you. For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believed 
that I came forth from God and I came forth from the father and I've come into this world. Again, I leave the world and go to the father. And his disciples said to him, see, now you're speaking plainly and using no figure of speech. Now we are sure that you know all things and have no need that anyone should question you. By this time, you have come forth from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, it is now come that you will sc be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the father is with me. These things I've spoken to you that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you have tribulation, be it, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus here is he's reassuring his disciples. Obviously, we know there's many instances where Jesus reassures his disciples and a lot of situations where the disciples needed reassured. They, they had many situations that they got themselves into that they thought that there was no way out. And obviously, Jesus would either find a way out or they would suffer through it and understand why they went through these trials. But we know that this is also gr a great reading for us to understand. And I'll go ahead and reread re verse 30, 33. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. As long as we have faith in Jesus and we live faithful lives as Christians, we know what our destination is. We believe we know what our destination is. And we need to take solace in that and use it to battle this anxiety that we can sometimes face. 2 Thessalonians 3.16 reads, Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace always in every way. The Lord be with you all. We, have, we each have our own struggles. We each have our own difficulties. We struggle with different things as Christians, but we all have the same source of reassurance, and that is Jesus. Mark 4, 35 through 41. On the same day when the evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over to the other side. Now when they had left the multitude, they, they took him along in the boat as he was, and other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern and asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? This is yet another example of Jesus reassuring his followers. He, they were in a situation that they felt that they were hopeless. And they, they were anxious about the storm. They didn't know if they were going to make it out. And Jesus just simply calms the storm. He comes out and calms the storm. And we can, we can think about this in a more figurative sense for us as well. We can think of life as this storm that we are going through. And, and Jesus has the capability to calm it for us. We are able to think about him, the salvation that we're given, and the hope of heaven. And we can use that to calm our worries and anxieties about, about life. and become closer to God himself and Jesus. Go ahead and read Revelations 21, verse 1 through 7. It's Revelations 21, 1 through 7. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, now New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven above saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God, and he shall be my son. We have this assurance in Revelation 21 that we have a future in heaven as faithful Christians. We have this promise of heaven, a place where there shall be no tears, there shall be no death, no sorrow, no, nor crying, no more pain. It says, for the former things have passed away. 
think about this. Think, think about it whenever you have these moments of anxiety. Think about what matters in this physical life that we have. What matters in the now? Think more on the future. Think more about heaven. We know that there will be no negative feelings in heaven. We know that we will be blessed to go there if we live faithful lives. And we need to keep that in mind as we go throughout our lives because we can easily let anxiety overcome us. I let anxiety overcome me last, last fall. And I think one of the best things for me, and my parents told me and I had known ahead of time, just pray to God. Just pray. Think about it. Think about the future that you have as a Christian. Go ahead. In conclusion, read Matthew 6, 25 through 34. It's Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put in, what, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today and it, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, neither worry, saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, what shall we wear? For all of these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Verse 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. God is with us. We know God is with us. And for this reason, we can't allow worldly worries to interfere with our faith. One, th one person that I, know, I didn't really quote much in this lesson, but I really should have, is Solomon. All things are vanity in this world. And we know that. We know we have a future in heaven, and that is all that matters. And coming to God with our problems is the best way to receive relief or encouragement as we need for this anxiety that we can suffer from time to time in this world. Lastly, the invitation. This lesson will be yours. We know what the plan to salvation is. I've had this slide up the last three times that I've preached. It's the same slide. I've copied and pasted it every time. But we understand that it's the pro same process for everyone. These scriptures that I have listed on here is the same for everyone. It's the same thing. I can't repeat it any more times than I have. As we are promised, heaven is Christians. So if you're not a Christian tonight and you feel the need to be baptized, think about it. Think, think about the anxieties you face in your life. Think about the things that you may be suffering. And think about how being a Christian can help that. Think about the promise that you would be given as a Christian. If you have been having issues and you are, if you're baptized and you've been having issues, you want, need to come forward and have prayers made for you, please do so. If you need to be baptized also, please come forward as we stand and sing.